There's a lot of high profile members of the IDW. Um, you've been on the, the Rubin Report a couple of times, but you're probably less well known than say Ben Shapiro, Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris. What's your, your role within the IDW? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say trying to anticipate um, what is likely to come next and trying to position um, the group so that it doesn't get torpedoed by the usual uh, mechanisms by which hopeful things are removed from public discussion, like the IDW. There was the New York Times article that, that came out and kind of named the IDW. Um, is there a kind of paradox in that it's no longer dark? Well, it was never dark, and that was uh, a large part of the joke. Um, we have only been dark to one thing, and that thing is the institutional media and the main platforms, be they academic or governmental. So, uh, if you will, I think that the mainstream media has pretended not to notice us, as just as they pretended to find it everything we say either vapid or outrageous. So, Sometimes both at the same time. Well, they try, right, uh, to be both offended and claim that it's content-free and not interesting. Um, but I think that you know what, what's really going on is that there's been a monopoly, effectively, on narrative held by the collection of major institutional voices. And to some extent, you have something like Fox News versus uh, NPR, and those are going to be different um, flavors. But to a remarkable extent, even those two voices are remarkably agreed on things that I don't think the rest of us uh, should be agreed on. And so the true spectrum of thought is far broader than um, people have been led to believe. And I think that's where the IDW comes in, that we are it's not that we're just outside of the Overton window. Many of the points we're making really aren't found anywhere inside of uh, mainstream media and established institutions, even though many of these things that we are talking about are simply commonplace observations. Did you have any doubts about that New York Times article? I mean, I had, uh, I had an infinite number of doubts about the New York Times article. Uh, the issue... Um, uh, well, there's a conflict. Part of me wants to work uh, quietly, and part of me realizes that we have to work in some public-facing capacity. And I personally have found it much more comfortable to have a private life, um, to not have uh, everything that I'm thinking um, broadcast uh, to a large audience. But I think we've run out of time, and so um, I think some of us are somewhat reluctantly uh, choosing to make a, a different call now. I think that with the current administration and the White House, you're seeing a, a real discontinuity with the past. And it wasn't the discontinuity that I was hoping for. Uh, we had to break with the past. And I think that the way in which we are now breaking with the past is so destructive. Um, nobody knows what to believe. Nobody quite knows what's true. Nobody knows where to turn. Um, this is not a tenable situation. And so either we're going to descend into some kind of permanent chaos, or there's going to be, have to be something that we reboot from. And that thing cannot be simply left or simply right. And that's one of the reasons that the IDW is hopeful to me, is that um, it's a collection of people who agree really on what a conversation sounds like. Uh, and, and that's important because ultimately you have to self-referee. It's not like there's a different species of person that's going to referee conversations. You can't tell whether um, one point carried the day by listening to Fox versus NPR because those two sets of referees might disagree as to who made the better point. You need a group of people who are willing to say, hey, you know, you made a better point. I've changed my mind and I've learned something that I didn't think about. And that kind of um, integrity in a conversation is what characterizes uh, a lot of the internal IDW discussion to me. It's that people agree not on their positions, they may not even agree as to what the facts are, but they usually agree as to what constitutes a conversation. I'd, I'd say, I mean, as an outside observer, being also sort of caught up in the excitement, what, what's amazing is kind of almost seeing the conversation become self-aware 
on the Rubin report, this sort of sense of Dave Rubin in particular is kind of like something's going on, something's happening. And you call it a conversation, it's also, it, it seems it's also modelling what thinking looks like, what genuine thinking looks like, where there's a sense of your mind could be changed by this conversation. It, and, and that, I guess, is, is showing how thirsty maybe we are for that sort of sense of genuine inquiry and genuine thinking. I think Dave, uh, in particular, is very moved by being out on the road, both going and touring his own comedy club appearances and also opening for Jordan Peterson. And he's insisted that I follow him uh, on a couple of occasions onto the stage. Um, and I, I now understand what he's talking about. He, People are coming up after these gigs and saying, I'm afraid to express what you expressed. Thank you for doing it. I'm almost at the point where I feel comfortable, but I lost uh, a couple of friends and some relatives who won't talk to me anymore. I was like, well, what, what did you say? And the person might have said something as innocuous as, I'm not convinced that there aren't biological differences <laughs> between men and women. And you're, you're trying to imagine a world in which this constitutes a controversial position. Of course, what's really going on is that people are very worried about what the consequences are of simply observing reality. So for example, if you observe that there's um, a lot of discussion um, around immigration, which synonymizes any desire to hold a border with being somehow afraid of other cultures, that's a crazy position to be in because almost everybody agrees that borders are important, that citizenship matters, and that not everybody can be a citizen of every country. Yet, somehow, to voice even something so simple as I want a border and I want, may want fewer immigrants rather than more immigrants, that person is now held up as if they've said something about their own uh, sense of their country's superiority and jingoist, their, their confused for being jingoistic or xenophobic or anything like this. So we've gotten to a completely crazy state whereby people who hold absolutely garden variety, common sense viewpoints are seeing themselves reflected in the media as if in a funhouse mirror. And they're seeing themselves come back so distorted and ugly that they're asking like, oh, what just happened? I, I fell asleep for a few years and I wake up Rick Van, Rip Van Winkle style and I'm in a world in which suddenly I'm the bad guy for simply holding very commonplace ideas. Now, those people are so excited to see conversations taking place with decency, with, um, with you know, comity and, and, and equanimity, so that these positions are not held in an ugly fashion, but they're simply seeing a conversation take place that they remember or that they dreamed uh, was possible, and they're not seeing it reflected anywhere else. And I think that's what's, what's really exciting, is, is that the IDW conversation is the public front of a national conversation that is bizarrely taking place in hushed whispers uh, with people metaphorically um, living in closets, not ready to, to jump out and declare, hey, I have some beliefs that you are going to find shocking, but to me are absolutely garden variety beliefs. The counter argument to that would be that actually the right are in power at the moment. You look at what Trump is doing with the, the children in cages and all of that sort of thing. So there is a political movement where a lot of these things are actually happening. Well, I don't see, I, I don't really believe that. Um, what I believe is that you've starved people for any ability to make a very simple point, right? So for example, uh, imagine that we analogized a country to a house. And the key question was, should we allow people to come for dinner, like a visitor? So that would be like a tourist visa or a temporary worker visa. So now we have an issue where every person who comes for dinner um, somebody in the family wants to give them a key and to formally adopt them into the family. Well, some members of the family are saying, wait, 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 whoa, slow down. You know, we're just having visitors over for dinner and maybe we could adopt a child, but this is not something that we want to do in an uncontrolled fashion. Suddenly they're being told by the couple members of the family who want sky high uh, adoption inside of the family that these are, are bad people and that they're bigoted and et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're going to have an absolutely embittered, angry group of people who are, who are saying, look, this is a home. 
and we're generous people, but adoption, I mean, you, you're going to dilute all of us in some fashion. Well, this is a mirror of the national conversation. And what you're hearing is not the sanest, most grown up voices who are representing a restrictionist position. You're getting the only people who are so incense, I, I guess, in, in such a desensitized state that they're going to make terrible arguments for holding up borders or enforcing uh, visas and uh, not pushing everybody towards a, on a path towards citizenship. So that's really what's going on, is, is that you're seeing a very bad version of restrictionism in the White House because that's all that's been offered by the system. But what is the IDW? It's going to give you a completely different alternative. It's going to say, look, other cultures are super exciting. We're definitely going to have some immigration and some of it's good for our country, some of it's good for the UK. But what is that level? Maybe that level should go up. Maybe that level should go down. It has zero to do with xenophobia. It has to do with legitimate interests of a country, people not wanting to be diluted, people wanting to have something of their own culture that they can bring to the international potluck, and not being told that their substrate culture is somehow deficient and that every culture that's coming in should be held up and celebrated. I mean, that's pretty common sense. I don't understand in any way, shape, or form why we've gotten to a place where the only people who can sort of talk in public are either very far... Uh, you know, jingoistic, far, far gone jingoistic restrictionists, or the tiny group of people in the IDW who are going to say, this doesn't make a lot of sense. And you've described this as a civil war within the left. Could you, could you explain what you mean by that? Um, sure. I mean, I think that the, the left that I relate to is the left that realizes that the past cannot supply the answers and that we have to actually progress because we can't stay here. It is not the left that believes we can wish ourselves into a beautiful future by pretending that the, re that the world is different than it actually is. So I, I think that the key thing that it, it is an agreement between these two groups is that we have to get to some sort of better place, and that is the, the progressive in progressivism. Where we are deeply divided, and you know, again, these are the divisions that are is much worse than between left and right. Um, how these absolutely imbecilic figures believe that you can just wish yourself into paradise, that you don't have to worry about markets, that you can just say, you know, free good things for everybody. Well, it just doesn't make a whit of sense. Or, you know, you're going to wish human beings to be both simultaneously non-diverse so that you can argue that any difference in pro rata shares of a group uh, in any occupation is evidence of oppression. And then you're going to turn around and argue that people are actually incredibly different because we're going to get a huge benefit from diversity. I mean, this is not even self-consistent. This is this would be offensive to an, an intelligent five-year-old. So I don't really believe that these progressives, uh, as they call themselves, and regressives as some of us call them, uh, are even making serious intellectual points. They're sort of trolling by pretending to believe in all things um, that just gum up the works. And so it's very important to me that not only do we not really spend time debating people who are not serious in their intellectualism, but that we realize that it is important to the diversity of mature and important ideas that we not spend undue effort engaging uh, ideas that are functioning very differently from regular conversation. It is as if um, somebody asks, should we have a diverse dinner tonight? Well, we could invite somebody from this position, from that country, from this gender, and then should we, should we invite a suicide bomber? Well, if you're a suicide bomber, you're, that bit of diversity is going to take down the entire conversation as well as all the people at the table. Right? Well, these are like suicide bombers in terms of their ideas. They are attaching themselves to real conversations and blowing up the conversation so that you can't actually speak. And I think what we need is we need to realize that the diversity of ideas that have to be explored um, 
hinges on not allowing in bad diversity. That is, you don't want a single person at the table who wants to scuttle the conversation. And that's not something that we've understood about the modern left. The modern left is very often focused on scuttling any realistic conversation so that it can t continue to threaten and terrorize people into pretending to hold positions that no sane person could possibly hold. Why do you think it's become like this? Well, I think my wife probably has the best explanation, which is that uh, when you're actually dependent on labor for your voter base, labor has economic issues. So this is the great search for something cheaper than labor. And identity turns out to be much cheaper than labor. If you can get somebody to vote for you, uh, where you're going to take uh, their future, their security, and their retirement, but you're going to celebrate the fact you know, that they came from Laos, um, that's a bad deal. Nothing against the Laotians, but for God's sake, stand up for yourself as a worker before you, you know, stand up for yourself as uh, somebody who needs to see Southeast Asia celebrated on the national stage. It's not that exciting. Demand more from, from uh, your representatives. This is the great search for the cheapest possible constituency. And that's exactly why I think it's happening. I think it's because um, the traditional Democratic voter base um, was too expensive. They wanted real change. They wanted to participate economically. They wanted to participate at the level of power. Um, and the, the donor base said, Is there, isn't there anything cheaper than labor? And I think they found something. Do you see the IDW as primarily a political project? No, I don't. I, I see it primarily as a precursor to anything decent. It, it, it's what has to succeed for us to have a political conversation. I don't think we're having a political conversation, uh, either internationally or nationally. I think we have people who are talking about nonsense positions. We just went back to the immigration position. There are only two positions I'm convinced aren't political. One is open borders, which is never going to happen, and the other one is closed borders, which is never going to happen. And yet, you very often encounter people who are talking in these terms as if um, these are the actual positions. So I don't think that we're having a political conversation. I think that what's been going on is, is that the mainstream media has been playing keep away ball, right? So this game where you're throwing the ball over somebody who's trying to catch it. Now, the public has been trying to get in on this conversation. But what keeps happening is, is that our fake left and our fake right are engaged in a completely fake conversation about fake items, including fake news, which they themselves are pushing out, and then claiming to fight fake news. So the whole thing is so saturated in falsehood um, that people are waking up to the idea, oh, I've forgotten what it sound, sounded like for people to actually have a discussion about a topic and how much time it takes. Uh, you know, in general, it can't be done with uh, four or five voices on a panel in 10 minutes with a few commercial interruptions. There's just almost nothing can be discussed that way. And what's, what's worse is that the very people who would be best able to discuss it are never going to be invited onto those programs. And how would you describe your political background? I, I understand from reading that you were a Bernie supporter. Yeah, I mean, I think we had two ter we had to three terrible candidates, and I thought Bernie was absolutely the least bad of the three. But I, n none of those people were fit for the White House. I mean, Donald Trump is by far uh, too erratic and um, too uh, destructive to the, to the fabric of the country. Hil Hillary is absolutely too engaged in some sort of machine that is being cynically operated for the few at the expense of the many. Uh, and Bernie's ideas about economic reform didn't make any sense. I, I simply thought that he was the most decent of the three and that we could easily survive four years of a Sanders presidency that might be kind of confused on economic issues, um, but with a big heart and uh, with somebody who was bold enough to claim socialism as his mantle inside of the United States, which is insane. Um, so that, you know, he was individualistic enough. And my feeling was that was the softest landing and that the Hillary option and the Trump option were, you know, nearly catastrophic for this political process. And you, you said earlier that you think the reason that you're speaking out now, the reason that you're sort of taking more of a profile is that you realize things have got to a certain point. Um, you, I think you said time is running out. 
Can you explain what you think that means? Sure. I mean, for one thing, um, you know, we've gone since the early 50s with no one having used a hydrogen device in anger against another people. Uh, I don't want to lose that track record with um, people working out uh, fantasies of machismo with toys and weapons that we've designed, we in the scientific and technical community have contributed. Um, I don't see the current crop of leaders as having the wisdom to wield such incredible power. I mean, these are people who, in my opinion, are getting worse and worse at their job. Um, so that's one of the great threats is, is that we need to make sure that that track record keeps going. Um, another key problem is, is that we've run out of uh, broad, uh, sources for broadly distributed stable growth. And people keep talking about bringing the jobs back and bringing growth back. And my belief is, is that we actually had a structural change in the economy in the early 70s that we've been lying to ourselves about um, with every gimmick known to man. And if we don't discover real economic growth, we're going to discover what happens when humans don't have economic growth that is broadly distributed. And it's not pretty. Um, I think that there's also the risk that we're going to lose a world that has been bipolar and even unipolar in terms of military strength after World War II. And a multipolar world is a frightening prospect, not because you don't want many voices to have a say, but because the game theory of a multipolar world is entirely unstable. And so things that we used to take for granted when it was the Cold War with two players uh, it's not clear what happens when you make it 10-player uh, or 13-player games uh, where lots of people have credible threats and everybody's trying to guess which alliances are going to break. I mean, just game theoretically, we're headed to a very unstable situation, which I'm not excited about. I would like to keep a world in which, you know, if, it, if it's the U.S. and China, so be it, but that the number of major players is kept to a relatively small number, even though... Uh, something in all of us would like a more uh, democratic world. I don't think the game theory works. And you talked about kind of a sense of a kind of hollowing out of politics. And I think you've spoken before about the sense that these systems get weaker and weaker as they continue. It seems that as time has gone on, the, the choices that we're being given in the political system get weaker and weaker. Well, because you're driving, you're systematically driving out uh, the people who should be trying to lead. You're making it so unpleasant to hold real opinions, to have real integrity. You're driving the costs of the specific group of people we need so that instead the only people who are going to show up are the people that we should fear most. And why does that happen? Um, because the sort of people we need are likely to be independent thinkers and institutions are terrified of independent thinkers. An independent thinker can reverse course, change their mind, take a totally different direction. For better or for worse, uh, Donald Trump has a lot of independent thinker in him. You may not like his independent thoughts, but you, you're not going to easily cage him in a perspective. He's going to break out of every cognitive prison that you put in front of him. Okay, imagine that you had somebody who had a great deal more wisdom and a lot more foresight than Donald Trump, but who wanted to be very nimble, who did not want complete transparency uh, when trying to negotiate a trade treaty, who was acting in the better interests uh, of most of the citizens of his country, but needed some privacy uh, for his family, for his own failings, uh, or potentially um, you know, for, for her weaknesses, uh, uh, Maybe because uh, this was her first time, you know, on a national stage, even if that person was the right person for the job. In such circumstances, um, you need to have something that is more decent to the kind of people that we need for leadership. And what you have is a world which has been throwing up candidates that are broadly acceptable to the institutions. We need candidates who are broadly unacceptable to institutions. It's most important. Like any candidate that is broadly acceptable to the institutions, to me, is dead on arrival. I don't mean that everyone who is not acceptable 
to the institutions is somebody I would like to vote for. But the subset of people that I'm interested in should be broadly unacceptable to the major institutions across the board, both left and right. Something a bit like the Groucho Marx quote that wouldn't want to be part of a club that would have me as a member. Well, the institutions don't want to reform. And so it's rational to me. I don't, I don't think it's quite that. I think that the idea is that there's two games here. There's trying to get the best deck chairs on the Titanic, and there's trying to rescue the ship. And in general, um, nobody can think of how to rescue the ship, which is a daunting task. So instead, what we're doing is we're fighting for position uh, in a losing game. And it's important that that stop. So you're, you're talking about a different way of thinking, people who have a different way of thinking. Is that what characterizes the members of the IDW? It's hard to say. I mean, I would say that everybody in the IDW is fairly disagreeable in the sense of big five personality inventory. So can you hold a position when you're the only person in a room that believes that thing? Like if it's you versus 100 people, I would say almost everybody in the core of the IDW uh, is capable of holding a position where everyone is against you. And I think that that trait is extremely rare. Something that's been talked about before is that in a way, the people in the IDW have been selected for. Like a lot of them have had quite high profile encounters. You, you look at um, Sam Harris with Ben Affleck, or you look at Brett Weinstein. Um, and there, there's a sense that they've in some way had to live out their ideas. There's a sense of bravery that they've had to stick up for themselves. Jordan Peterson and C16, I mean, you, could, you can list a lot of times where as you said, they had to be that one person who was thinking a certain thing. You no, know, I mean, I think I made the point, probably on the Rubin Report, that what's going on is that when you ask any large collection of people to salute a nonsensical flag and pledge allegiance to it, and more or less everyone makes the calculation, I guess if this is going to get me through my day, I'll salute any flag. Then you've got the one gal or one guy who doesn't want to. Well, my observation is that that person is usually sitting on an entire mountain of interesting thoughts that they don't have the freedom to simply make a convenience readjustment. And so from that perspective, yeah, in general, if you ask uh, a thousand people to salute a flag that makes no sense and tell them that they'll be incentivized, you'll get a thousand dollar check at the end or you, know, you won't lose your job, and somebody stands up and says, no way. I'm getting out of here. Do what you want. That person is usually much more interesting than just being a contrarian. That person is usually saying no because they've got an entire worldview that is uh, built by hand and, and, and bespoke. And so that's why this method of finding people has been relatively fruitful. It's people who don't back down usually don't back down for a reason because there's every reason just to go along. And what is, what is the nature of that kind of ideology? That the, the, the thing that unites, the thing that unites, I guess, the IDW at the moment is a resistance to a certain type of thinking or a certain type of ideological thinking, especially in the media. How would you define that, that thinking? Well, I mean, it's very simple. Um, here are two characteristics that I think you'd find in almost any member of the IDW. Almost every member of the IDW that I can think of is going to uh, have very positive responses to um, things that come out of Muslim culture. And almost every member of the IDW is going to have a sense that there is a link between uh, Islam and terror that is active at the moment, that is not active at the same level for any other group. Terror against civilians. Okay, well these are two simple principles, which is you've got a very large religion. Most people in that religion are just like everybody else, perfectly lovely people. Um, You've got a dangerous uh, subculture in the religion. Its size uh, is, you know, is open for question. But there are a lot of people um, who um, are flummoxed. Why is it that I can't observe that somebody is saying Allahu Akbar after a mass killing? Uh, the news reports that somebody said something in a foreign language or somebody said God is great, you know, well, you're not really reporting the news, are you? So that, 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 that rankles. And on the other hand, you can't have people saying, okay, Muslims are a problem. That's not going to work either. So 
you'll simply find that there are these core balances that people in the IDW, I think, are better at striking, which is like, we don't want to be closed borders, we don't want to be open borders. Um, immigrants aren't simply uh, positive, hardworking people who contribute to our economy, and they're not simply negative um, you know, gang members and welfare queens. Whatever these positions are, this is how the mainstream has been fighting through these idiocies uh, for years. And the people in the IDW in general hold relatively moderate perspectives. And I, I think that that's, it's bizarre that it distinguishes us, that we're willing to hold moderate perspectives in public where, where the media is trying to drag us to, either they're communists or they're fascists, either these people are religious whack jobs or they're atheist uh, nihilists. Well, in general, no. These are people who are balancing competing perspectives. They're engaging in a dialectic. And it is strange that there is no training for holding those positions in public when the awesome power of the media is to misportray everybody who attempts to find new ground. And Dave Rubin said that pretty much anyone who was trying to think beyond ideology, so he was talking to his viewers and saying, you're part of the intellectual dark web if you're prepared to think about these things in a similar way. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you think it's a bigger movement than just the, the, the names, the figures who have been kind of associated with it? Well, there's sort of what I would call IDW Nation, which is the collection of people who's trying to um, you know, add to the conversation who might not be part of the core group. And I think what I see there is it's not enough to try to struggle outside of the box. You also have to balance. Like There is this issue of decency. You have to both be willing to look at the world for what it is, not what you want it to be. And you also have to bring a kind of decency. You can't take the cheap, easy way out by saying, you know, our biology predisposes us to violence and therefore violence is a good thing. Or, um, you know, you, you can't be xenophobic uh, because you realize that we can't be open borders. And you can't be open borders because you realize that closed borders xenophobia is nonsense. You have to continue to struggle. And I think that that's an important thing that people don't yet understand. That the IDW, generally speaking, doesn't take the easy outs. It would prefer to struggle between two competing ideas than simply sign up for one or the other because it's clean. You, in the, the Rubin Report, I think, with your brother, Brett, you talked about how we pretty much had a blank slate, or we, we were starting from a blank slate because all of the prefab answers, libertarianism, socialism, even capitalism, don't work or play themselves out for game theoretic reasons. Mm -hmm. Could you explain what that means? And if so, what, what does that conversation start looking like? Well, think about any of the major schools of thought that have failed to carry the day. It could be Austrian economics, it could be market socialism, uh, it could be mercantilism, it could be um, you know, hardcore capitalism, whatever it is. The reason that none of these schools has prevailed totally is that none of these ways of thinking work under all circumstances. And, you know, people have fantasies, like, you know, that the free market is, the market always knows the true value of everything. Well, even um, a free marketeer should know that markets fail for various reasons, like in the case of public goods. So you have to hybridize all of these extreme positions in order to get anything that functions. And in biology, um, you t think of this in terms of regulated expression. You might have different uh, responses to different environments, but which response uh, is mounted um, depends on the environment. So if, should you have different rules for free speech in wartime? Maybe you need a Supreme Court to pretend that the Constitution has to be interpreted a little bit more strictly in times of war and then loosened up at another time. So in general, all of these very simple answers, the market is always right, the dem democracy is always right, health care and education are human rights, all of these things just don't work because they're too simplistic to carry uh, the complexity of a modern society. 
There was a, a really sort of deceptively simple but quite profound thing that either you or Brett said as well, which was about how one thing that is very difficult to survive market forces is the pursuit of truth. That truth was corrupted by market forces. And that seems to kind of explain a lot of the crisis of journalism, a lot of the crisis for the educational institutions. Could you explain a little bit more about why you think that is? Well, um, this goes back to a point I made that the clearing price of truth is far higher than the newspaper uh, reader was willing to pay. So the idea is that if you actually had real truth, it would be very valuable to you in, in circumstances where you could act upon it. And on the other hand, a lot of the other truth is not very interesting. And so occasionally you find truths that, that can't command uh, an important price because they're just too dull. Um, they're not important. Uh, so I, I do believe that in part uh, you should look at something like journalism and realize that the business model doesn't quite make sense, but that there might be ways in which... Um, we would be better served. For example, independent investigative journalists might be a better force for finding out institutional uh, malfeasance than corporate uh, investigative journalists who might be um, captured by virtue of the fact that you have a mixed subscriber and advertiser model. Um, I do think that sometimes you have to treat truth as a public good. And you may have to decide that you are going to pay for it, um, not at the level that the market will bear, uh, not at the price that the market will bear, but at a higher price because it's in the long-term interest of your, of your society's survival. I think that's very true in the sciences. Uh, it is important to realize that scientists produce a public good which is both inexhaustible, inexcludable, and often not patentable by virtue of international um, intellectual property issues. And the most important group of truth seekers are probably not the journalists, but the scientists. And you should be trying to figure out as a society how to immunize those people from the market. The problem is, is that the people who want that not done are very powerful um, because they are representing powerful institutional interests. So it's an uphill battle. It seems that the, the phenomena of the IDW is, is part of this great intellectual awakening. I mean, you're seeing people being really hungry for long-form content on YouTube, three-hour conversations. People are, are clearly hungry for a lot more intellectual stimulation. I don't, than I don't getting... actually agree with this. I no? mean, this is an idea that um, I think Jordan has slightly wrong. Uh, so uh, for a while, I've been making the point that there was a change between... Um, writing for television was sort of the lowest form of, uh, uh, of an art and that writing for movies allowed for real character development but that the um, multi-season, multi-episode shows with very long storylines actually has the greatest character development and so the, the greatest writers are now writing for TV the important thing to understand is, is that it's not just the advent of long-form podcasting. What it is, is having the courage to say something using that medium. You have long-form podcasts that aren't attracting almost anybody. And the only reason that the IDW uh, is behaving in a different fashion is that it's mar marrying the content that brave people are starved for with the change in technology. And so, in general, most things don't work in a three-hour format. What works in a three-hour format is when you're living through what I'm calling left Carthyism, where the modern left, which is my side of the aisle, has gone so completely insane that people are starved for normal conversation as if it was Samizdat in the former Soviet Union. And so you have an underground network, if you will, um, that is supplying that need for reality. Uh, and the only reason we're underground is because the mainstream is pretending, for the most part, not to notice that this phenomenon is existing, which is fascinating. And where do you hope that this IDW conversation will go in the future? 
well, I hope it goes to the heart of everything that is um, denying our ability to use our eyes and our ears and our minds as decent people. If you're simply observing the world as it is and you're thinking about it with a big open heart and you're trying to be decent about it at the same time that you're trying to provide for your family and concerned about your country's welfare, uh, there's no reason that you should be huddling uh, in the cupboard afraid that uh, if anyone hears that you think that men are different from women uh, that you're going to be consigned to the dustbin of history and fired for it. It's re absolutely essential that people stop being terrorized for holding garden variety positions.